Alright, welcome back everyone. Hope life was good enough for all of you. I know I'm feeling a bit of food coma coming on, so that's not great. But uh, let's not fall asleep during the next track session, alright? It's very interesting. It's gonna be about learning for nature. And hosting uh, the next track will be our moderator, Nasruddin. Without further ado, Nasruddin, please. A uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Nashuddin, and as mentioned, I'll be uh, moderating the Learning for Nature track. This track was, spe uh, was specially curated uh, to, uh, to put a spotlight on regional efforts that transform scientific data into actionable, community involved conservation management tools. Our speakers' uh, expertise are very diverse and spread across marine and terrestrial terrains and various human-wildlife interfaces. They'll be sharing more about the strat strategies they have used to mo mo motivate conservation actions in their regions and will touch on skills that we, we as future conservationists need to effect change for nature. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Anwar Uradu Saku. Dr. Anwar works at the Faculty of Veterinarian Science in Mahilo University. His line of work focuses on epidemiology, infectious disease, and veterinary medicine. Zoonotic spillover is an underrepresented topic in the conservation space. However, the recent pandemic has brought, brought it forward uh, to the forefront of discussion. Today, he will share more about his research on the surveillance of zoonotic diseases and how we can better prepare for the next outbreak. Dr. Anwar, please. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, it's very honored to be here with you. And yes, um, it's very challenging to be the first speaker after lunch. And, <laughs> and for me to keep you all awake with me throughout the 10 minutes. So, so uh, my talk today is on our activity. Uh, our activity at MOSB, so just remember this one, this acronym, because the, long, the, the name is quite long. The actual name is the Monitoring and Surveillance Center for Zoonotic Diseases in Wildlife and Exotic <laughs> Animals. <laughs> yes, actually too long, even for me. So the center was approved by, approved by the Thai cabinet. The center emerged with the emergence of avian influenza H5N1. I, I, I think you know. Uh, you all know about this virus, right? Right? H5N1, avian flu, that can kill people, can kill animals, can kill everyone, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the center was established to provide the monitoring and warning. We want to establish sort of early warning that we're going to have another threat uh, in our life. And throughout my talk, I will, I will tell you that we do have a lot of emerging diseases through our life, in our lifetime, before our lifetime, and of course, in the, 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 the in next generation as well. And our center was uh, already uh, uh, approved as FAO, F, and, F, and F, FAO Air Reference Center for Zoonotic and Wildlife Diseases. Then the center, what we are doing here, what we are doing at the center, we keep monitoring the the emergence of the zoonotic diseases. We do the surveillance monitoring for the emerging wildlife and zoonotic diseases. And of course, we do something also in the past of ecosystem. We do this investigation, surveillance, collaboration, edu and edu education and training. It may seem to you like an advertisement, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Then why, why, why I'm doing this? Because if you want to do something, I mean, in Thailand, based on, on, on something like this, if you want to do something on the disease surveillance, collaboration, education, and training, so you can contact us. It's me here, and Dr. Slim is my boss over there, so you can talk to her as well, if you want to do internship or something like that. <laughs> yes, and, uh, oh yes, please come. <laughs> besides, besides joining the end park, you can join us as well. <laughs> Okay, in our activities, <laughs> not competition, not competition. Okay. So in our, 
our activity is we do something on every floor of us because it's the it's the first mission we have. So we we catch a lot of birds and we show birds like this. We do the cannon net. We use a cannon net. We use a mist net, and we catch also migratory birds. And in this this is a paper is published in Plus One. You can get access freely from anywhere because it's an open access. And we use the satellite remittance tracking. So you may you may I don't know. Have you seen one? But you may you may come across with the uh, seagull, seagull like this, with the Athena, with the satellite telemetry like this. Then yeah, if you see one, it might be one one of ours. <laughs> then uh, we study the five ways of this this migratory bird, and what we found is that they travel a lot, travel from China from right here. Uh, to to Thailand here in the in the Gulf in the Gulf of Thailand with uh, some stopping over in in other in other countries along the way and then some of them they travel further to to Cambodia in Tolesa the largest water bodies in Southeast Asia and still one of them travel southwards to um, Vietnam they might have a better I mean, more beautiful beach, I don't know. So, <laughs> but all of them travel backward to China, then they keep traveling back and forth like this. Then talking about disease, so this is no disease, or diseases, they know no boundary, right? So then they don't know whether this is Thailand, China, or Singapore, or, or Malaysia. So they don't, the disease, they know nothing. And the disease can go along with the bird as well. Well, we have another paper published on another species of bird this is the open bill stocks. You know, open bill stock, right? It's the, 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 the beak is like this, so it's open. That is why they call open bill stock, and it's designed to capture snails. So one of the favorite, uh, favorite animals to eat for this type of bird, oh, five minutes left, is the uh, apple open snail. This is a theory of change. If apple snail, never been in Thailand before, is an alien species. So we had we, we, we have apple snail once, and then they spread you know, everywhere in Thailand. Then we have this kind of bird. Basically, the, the stock, this stock, they keep migrating back and forth from Thailand and India, Bangladesh, and getting back to Thailand again. But after we have this kind of species, and we have been tracking them for at least five years, no birds getting back to India. They just keep staying in Thailand. It's like they get kid card. <laughs> so they all stay in Thailand and enjoy our apple snail. Okay? <laughs> this is the change of ecology, the change of one species affecting other species. And the birds can harbor the disease like every flu as well. Then we do have another study on the zoonotic disease on wildlife trade and Dr. Nga another speaker after me, she will talk more about this. But anyway, we, we do have the sort of uh, con connection in, in Southeast Asia with this one. The member countries are Cambodia, China, Laopedia, Thailand, and Vietnam. That is an effort. And recently, you may know that uh, the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, can infect also, not just only us, can infect other animals like dogs and cats, and you may, you, you may also uh, hear some news that, that the virus can infect wildlife, right? But we don't know whether they can infect the exotic animals. I mean, exotic pets, pets like dogs and cats, but stay with us. And people keep these animals as pets as well, like lab beads, sugar guiders, hedgehogs, and so, so on and so forth. Then, yes, we, we try to we try to collect samples from them, and we also test for, 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 for the SARS-CoV-2. Interestingly, uh, like a third of the pet owners, they, yeah, has been contacting and infect, infected this COVID-19. But fortunately, we didn't find any virus in these animals. We don't know whether they're not there, but we, or we, just, <laughs> we just didn't catch one. That's another story. And also we, we conducted another, stock, uh, an, another study uh, in the animal scavenging along the carpet dumping sites in Thailand's 
you may see that people using also their, their face masks and their clothes during COVID-19 uh, pandemic, right? And some of some of those uh, those piece of garbage, like the infectious one, can get into the dump site like this, the big dump site. And we we call example from rats and other animals around the area. And also we we collect some sample from tigers, and we test for SARS-CoV-2 as well. And other animals and other animals like crocodiles. Yes, if you want to work with crocodiles, yes, come to us. <laughs> <laughs> and also, yeah, we do some surveillance. And yes, in terms of conservation, we are complementary somehow because during during our sample collection, we also measures. Uh, measures the, the size of the animals, so far and so forth, so that we have the data, viable data of those animals for the conservation purpose as well. Then we have a lot of sample from mammals and birds and, and other uh, species as well, but most of the sample we have uh, are collected from birds and mammals. Then most of the sample, of course, our mission is for avian flu and other diseases, but most of the sample we test for avian flu. Okay, I have one minute left. Then, <laughs> at the end, we would like to do more. We just don't want to collect sample and then test it, collect sample and test it. Uh, we want to make a sort of network to connect other institutes together. And we would like to be the WAR, the War Organization for Animal Health, Coordinating Center for Wildlife Health and Zoonotic Diseases in the region. Uh, we got supported from, from, this is Dr. Jonathan Sleeman from the USGS National Wildlife Health Center from, from the US and help us to form sort of collaboration. And at the end, we try to uh, link all the, all the organizations in Thailand that work with One Health, with the Wildlife Health to link all of them together to work under the same umbrella to make the safer world for wildlife and for human beings like us. And this is another network for Southeast Asia, which is chaired by Dr. Anna Wong. <laughs> and we are, at the most, we are the secret lead for, for the network. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Anwar. Now I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Nguyen Nga. Ms. Nga is the Wildlife Health Specialist and Policy Influencing Team Leader of the Wildlife Conservation Society in Vietnam. She has been with WCS for more than a decade and has, has strived to create safer human-wildlife interactions at high-risk interfaces in Vietnam, such as the wildlife trade supply chain in Indochina. In Indochina. Without further ado, please welcome Ms. Nga. So, hello everyone. My name is Nga. I'm uh, the policy influencing team leader from Wildlife Health Specialist for WCS Vietnam. And uh, thanks the uh, organization board to give me the, the opportunity to stand here to say to, uh, to talk to you about the, um, our effort on doing wildlife health surveillance and um, uh, on that the, with the ultimate goal is combating wildlife trafficking. So um, for the genetic disease surveillance, uh, as Dr. Uh, Anwar just said, say, we have um, quite some similar activities in Vietnam, quite same approach and same surveillance, but uh, with specific uh, focus for Vietnam program, we are focused on the high-risk interface where have the direct contact between wildlife and humans during, uh, along the wildlife trade chains in Vietnam. So um, in Vietnam, we collect samples from uh, different taxa, animal taxa, and also um, different wildlife taxa like pangolins, bats, rodents, non-human primates, small carnivores, 
and also we collect sample from human who uh, using the one health approach and work with the uh, uh, FAO to testing the domestic samples for the same um, set of the viral families that identify as the um, uh, high risk of uh, genetic pathogens. So as as I mentioned, we uh, with Vietnam we are more focused on the high risk interface along the wildlife trade chains. So we collect sample and test for different viral family. You can see here this is the brief of our findings. Uh, why uh, after we testing the sample for uh, coronavirus, flavivirus, herpes, influenza, paramiso, rhabdo, and others. And the interesting thing that like we found both known and novel virus. The novel one is uh, have been not found uh, identified before. And the uh, viral family is detected from different species along the wildlife trade chain, uh, including the wildlife farms, which is one of the model is quite uh, common in Vietnam. The markets, the wet markets, the restaurants, and the wildlife trade where we collect sample at the in cooperation with the rescue center and in cooperation with the law enforcement officers to collect sample from uh, Caesar wildlife and uh, slaughterhouse and uh, others like guano collection area where the people go to the bat guano farm uh, bat, uh, bat cave to collect the bat guano as to use it as the fertilizers so yeah we found different viruses from different taxa and at different uh, interface. So this is one of the publications um, to distribute our finding related to the coronavirus found from rodents and bats. Uh, so with the finding with the um, analysis results, we can see the specific increase of the amplification of coronavirus infections along the wildlife supply chain from the trader to uh, market and to the um, restaurants. And on uh, in March 2000, uh, 2022, we published the uh, paper related to the SARS-CoV-2 related coronavirus. We detect uh, from uh, thunder pangolins that are uh, confiscated and uh, from the illegal wildlife trade activity. So we, from the more than, um, for, but all of the results is um, from the pangolin scissors in uh, 2018. And uh, with that case, more than 100, around 100 uh, pangolin individuals uh, uh, confiscated. And beside uh, doing the quantitative research to collect the biological sample. We are also doing the qualitative research by doing the uh, ethnographic interview and also the focus group discussion with the people who work, uh, who has close, con close contact with wildlife, who is a farm owner, who is a farm a wildlife farm worker. So to understand uh, the behavioral risk that can be the, the risk for genetic disease transmission during their work, uh, during the contact with wildlife, and also to understand more their um, awareness about the risk, or they already know about the risk, but what is the motivation, why, why they still doing that? So uh, we doing the, uh, the activity, the qualitative research to understand more about the behaviors, then from that we will have more uh, action more on uh, using the preventive approach. So we do a lot of activity to doing the wildlife uh, health surveillance to gather more evidence, but how to make it more sustainable? Because that from the um, support from the our side from the N NGO, um, non-government organization, but how to make it more sustainable? So by uh, on by doing on the job support and also uh, training the government officers and get them to work with, uh, to go with us to the field to collect sample and train them how to do it. So then later they uh, build it in the system then they can do it by them themselves. 
and another way to make it more uh, sustainable and more stronger, get more commitment from our partner is build the system and put it in the policy. And uh, last in the previous project, we all I just put as a case study like for the we also detected the H five N one the influenza virus in the open bill. Um, um, birth in, uh, in the Mekong Delta region. And at that uh, case, we work with different stakeholders. Like we, we need to form a team of different stakeholders to, to get the surveillance uh, activity done, like uh, with the Department of Animal Health, with the National Park, and also in, get other stakeholders to uh, collect information. And especially that uh, with our efforts, we have the office in different country, especially in the region. We received the information that in Cambodia, they have the case of H5N1 in the areas that near the border with Vietnam. So we call to our partner, government partner at Department of Animal Health to say that we that's the, the risk for Vietnam side, even we haven't uh, identified that case yet. So we inform them the information and work with them to develop the uh, surveillance to uh, get better prepared uh, for the um, disease. So that's that's just an example of the S of the, the uh, SOP we develop of the uh, collaboration partner collaboration for um, co uh, for doing the health wildlife health surveillance. And uh, for doing all of those activities, as I mentioned, the most important is the partnership. It's not only for with uh, our government partner, but also for other uh, NGO and international uh, partner. And uh, uh, for with our one-year approach, it's not only for animal health, but also for human health partner. And uh, with further um, inter uh, with further efforts or approach like make change in policy, we need to engage the law enforcement officer and also the policy makers in our activity as well to make change and more sustainability. And thank you, that's uh, my, that's some share from my, uh, thanks for your attention. All right, thank you, Ms. Inga. Uh, please take a seat. Now that we better understand that uh, the techniques used to monitor zoonotic diseases, uh, it is apparent that data collect collection is at the heart of successful implementation of conservation prog programs. As such, our next speaker will be bridging the, the gap between science and technology for conservation ma management. Our next speaker might be a familiar face to our local participants, but for those who don't know, he is the group director for National, Biodiver uh, Bi uh, National Biodiversity Center and the Fort Canning Park and the Istana. Let's get a round of applause for Mr. Riley. Thank you, Ness. Who's keeping time? <laughs> Just in case I will go. All right, now um, I'm going to take the next 10 minutes to give you an overview of how MPARX has harness the power of technology and digital tools to support nature conservation. My colleague Chung Beng has done an awesome job explaining our city and nature vision. I think the analogy was comparing it with a happy marriage. So I should <laughs> try to outshine him. But uh, one thing that he didn't mention is that actually each and every of our strategies is underpinned by technology to, in order to propel us forward uh, to achieve our vision. And uh, to achieve this, we have formulated an overarching science and tech master plan covering the entire gamut of things that we do in NPARX. Uh, for those who are not familiar, we, this is yeah. uh, we look at, we work on tree management, we also look into plant health, animal health, wildlife conservation and nature uh, conservation, wildlife management and nature conservation. Now, um, under this master plan, we have grouped the related work streams into ecosystems so that we can better leverage on related science, research, and OPSEC to transform the way that we traditionally do things. For the purpose of today's sharing, uh, because it's only 10 minutes, I'll only focus on the nature conservation and biodiversity management ecosystem. Uh, 
Um, now it is leveraging on technology uh, is not new. We have been using different types of sensors to monitor and track wildlife. Uh, and then the data is then analyzed using digital tools to derive insights that will help us make the correct conservation decisions. I'll give you an example. Under the island-wide ecological profiling exercise, uh, we have used a least resistance pathway modeling to project the movement of animals across Singapore. And uh, that has allowed us to identify ecological corridors where animals would most likely take to traverse between core habitats within the island. This information has enabled us uh, to make better decisions in picking the locations to establish our networks of nature parks with a view to extend the nature capital beyond our reserves, beyond the boundaries of our reserves throughout the island. So this whole thing is actually driven by the approach of defragmentation. Our habitats are fragmented. We are doing this hopefully to defragment. Now for the marine environment, uh, we adopted the use of the agent-based modeling to gain a better understanding of how our coastal and marine habitats are connected and uh, enabled by hydrodynamic currents. And this information has helped us identify and establish our very first marine park at Sisters Island, which is a key source of uh, coral larvae within our waters. Beyond modeling, we deploy video and camera traps. These are yeah, cute, but the technology is not new, but we deploy them. And we also deploy uh, night vision cameras so that we can monitor the behavior of animals at night, nocturnal animals at night. With, with the data collected, we then run analysis uh, to establish the population densities of our wildlife in the our nature areas. And this allows us to continuously refine and review our wildlife conservation and management approach. Uh, beyond camera traps, we also leverage on bioacoustics for wildlife surveys. Uh, we do this by recording the vocalization of birds and then using and training an algorithm to identify the bird species based on their cause. So this is done by first filtering out the ambient background noise and the AI will help us do that. Then we match the bird cause against a database to identify the species. Bioacoustics is also used to survey, survey marine biodiversity um, based on the sounds that marine animals make underwater. When, dive, when the water conditions are not favorable for diving, uh, we send out our underwater drones to undertake remote surveys. Sometimes we also use them to perform pre-dive surveys so that divers can save time and resources uh, when they eventually get into the water because it will be a more targeted dive. They know exactly where are the things that they are looking for. Over the years, we have been tracking and monitoring the movement of migratory birds, shore birds, um, because we want to grow our own scientific knowledge of migratory birds and also for biosurveillance and disease monitoring. So that's quite important too. The way we have done this has evolved quite a bit over the years. We start off by uh, ringing this. How do we get that? So how do I get that? <laughs> bringing the birds very manual way. And then this evolved to radio trackers, geolocators, and more recently, satellite trackers that en enable us to monitor the location of the birds near real time. So to illustrate, uh, these are 15 birds tagged with the satellite trackers. As you can see, they are using the known fly path uh, on the right-hand side, which is the East Asian, Australian fly path. Uh, but you also see that they are using the Central Asian flyway. So this discovery underscores Singapore's strategic importance as a key intersection between two major flyways. We have since published this finding uh, in Nature Scientific Reports. OK, 
okay, rats are uh, something I've spoken about it. So he has a point, uh, how come we need to differentiate between humans and animals? Uh, because it's meant to get people to slow down. But uh, <laughs> the point is that uh, it is hu humans know how to cross the road in a smarter way than animals, we all hope. So it is meant to help the animals who will tend to loiter around, as you can see the monkeys, yeah, uh, and they get in harm's way. We're, we're now uh, extending the use of rats to other hotspots such as Rifle Range Road. Okay, beyond that, we also have a, a forest fire detection and monitoring system. So this system uses a combination of multi-spectral cameras and AI uh, to detect smoke and forest fires so they can identify that the smoke is coming uh, from the forest. And this is done over a very wide area because our forested remnants are still of a considerable size. Uh, once upon detection, upon detection, the system will trigger a siren. So if you're in the vicinity, you would hopefully run out. And it will also send an SMS alert to staff who will then be able to uh, respond swiftly and activate the fire hygiene resources. Now to better protect our marine habitats, we also develop a oil spill forecast and decision support system. This system uh, models the trajectory and spread of an oil spill and predicts where you'll make landfall. So with this, with this information, we can then Governize the team uh, to deploy oil booms to intercept the oil spills before they they affect our coastal habitats. Last but not least, I think I'm in good time. Last but not least, um, we are. This is an area that we are also starting to leverage on technology. We have set up a center for wildlife forensics that will use DNA analysis, artificial. Uh, vision-based AI and spectrography and chemical analysis to combat wildlife trade by detecting and investigating uh, illegal shipments of uh, wildlife, animals, and, and uh, plant parts. Now, I've come to the end of my sharing, but I just want to highlight that this is only a fraction or a snapshot of the entire digitalization ecosystem that we have. So if you want to understand more, feel free to talk to me later. We also have a digital twin of trees and you know that it's quite interesting in terms of the tech stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryan Lee, for that insightful speech. I would like to introduce our next speaker, hailing from, the, from, hailing from Indonesia, Ms. Willy Johani. She has worked for over 25 years to improve the management and financial sustainability of marine protected areas and reduce the use of unsustainable fishing practices in Southeast Asia. She is a co-founder and executive director of the Coral Triangle Center, so CPC, an independent non-profit organization established in Bali in 2010. Today, she'll be sharing more about the program she has created at the CPC and that built local capacity and involved local communities in long-term uh, uh, sustainable marine conservation management. Ms. Johani, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, organizers. I feel very honored to be here. And great to see so many young people uh, interested in, in conservation. And I'll talk a little bit about the Coral Triangle Center. But before that, I'd like to share a little bit of my uh, ocean story. As a lot of people ask me, how do you get into marine conservation? How do you get into the sea in the first place? And um, I'm an Indonesian national, but my parents uh, left for the Netherlands to study in the late, uh, the early 50s, and they got married there. My dad is from North Sumatra, and my mother from North Sulawesi, so they would have never met when they would stay in Indonesia, but they met in the Netherlands, they got married, and my sister and I were born and raised in Holland in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So I became a junior ranger in the early 70s with WWF. And that really gave me the opportunity to go to the field and learn a lot about nature. And it was such a wonderful experience that made me decide to study biology. And then at the time you had Jacques Cousteau. Uh, for those who know him, he was one of the first 
explorers underwater and actually was the inventor of the scuba tank. And that made me to choose uh, marine uh, biology at the time in the Holland. And uh, in the Netherlands, before you actually go into open water, you have to train one year in the pool. So you can imagine it was not so interesting. But after that one year, we really were glad to go into uh, the North Sea. And we were very happy to see two fish and one anemone on one dive. You can imagine, it's like very cold. You don't see much on the water. But then we went to the Mediterranean and it became much better in terms of coral reefs, in terms of uh, the biodiversity in that area. And that really um, brought me to Indonesia, where you have actually the, the most diverse coral reefs uh, in the world, apart from other countries in this area. And it gave us a journey and insight how the reefs are actually uh, so much uh, diverse here in the tropical uh, area of the Asia Pacific. And uh, again, it's very important for especially marine conservation to visualize um, the marine uh, biodiversity. As on the terrestrial part, it's very easy to uh, see um, the forest, to see the deforestation, but underwater, it's so much more uh, complicated. So I just want to share uh, the 30%, you heard that earlier this morning about uh, protecting 30% of the oceans, terrestrial and inland waters by 2030. And um, at uh, Montreal last year, 180 countries actually endorsed this particular commitment. And uh, although the ocean covers 70% of the planet, only about 2% is actually effectively managed by um, marine protected areas or other uh, measures. And uh, earlier this year, I attended the International Marine Protected Area uh, Conference, IMPACT 5, and a lot of uh, talk was about uh, the 30%. But I'd just like to share some of the discussions about, you know, 30%, what happens with the 70%. So it's not about uh, focusing only about 30% and then trashing the other 70 We still have to look at the oceans as a whole. As Sylvia Earl said, you know, we don't uh, protect only 30% of our heart. It's really a holistic approach, how we actually keep the oceans uh, healthy. Also, the other debate about this is about uh, indigenous people. We heard a lot about from the Philippines, how we engage local communities, and also uh, how do we uh, measure this effectiveness. And a lot of debate is now about OECM, so OECM, is also about other effective area-based conservation measures besides MPAs. And it's about recognizing also the uh, areas conserved by indigenous people or by other uh, means that actually, in effect, leads to uh, conservation on the ground. So the CITES, of course, we heard a lot about it. It's a very important uh, treaty. And I'm uh, very happy to say that last year at COP19 of CITES, 95 shark species were added to the list, including also guitar fish, which are uh, very uh, funny animals with a very flat uh, animal on the floor. But uh, marine animals have been on the list for many years. The Napoleon bass, we have seahorses, uh, giant clams, um, corals, turtles. A lot of uh, animals underwater are um, in danger and should be on this list for extra protection. Um, just a bit more about the Coral Triangle region. So uh, this is a region that is right, widely recognized by the scientific community as the most diverse area for coral reef and reef fish species. So you see in the dark red, these are six countries, including Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands, that harbor the most diverse reefs on Earth in terms of 550 to 600 species and they form a global refuge to help replenish coral reef areas around the world. And uh, they also harbor a lot of marine animals in the coral triangle. We have blue waves, uh, blue whales. We have in Indonesia only uh, more than 20 uh, whale species. This is the sunfish, this funny fish. It actually f uh, swims like a bird, very small fins. But also the manta rays, uh, we have six to seven species of turtles in the coral triangle and a lot of marine uh, mammals. So it's such a diverse area that is in peril. So what you see is um, 
the threats uh, very much linked to, of course, climate change, which causes coral bleaching and eventually the death of a lot of corals that forms so the habitat for so many species underwater. Uh, also, um, tourism, uh, plastic pollution, of course, um, just the uncontrolled development on the land um, provides a lot of sedimentation that uh, kills a lot of the coastal marine ecosystems in the oceans. So, in 2009, we actually, um, at the time I worked for the Nature Conservancy, international NGOs and the six set of states worked together with um, various uh, multilateral bilateral donors to set up a collaboration, a lead regional collaboration called the Coral uh, Triangle Initiative. And this was a very mesmerizing event. It was the first of its kind that the six head of states had to sign off on the Marine Conservation uh, Treaty. And very happy to see Mundita, Wendy. Uh, we were all involved in this amazing uh, initiative, which is still active today. And at the heart um, of the Coral Triangle, um, is Indonesia, it's the largest archipelago in the world, with 70,000 islands. We have also a lot of uh, people there, more than 300 million, depending on those uh, coastal ecosystems. And it, it's in that socio-economic context that we try to uh, preserve those wealthy uh, coastal marine ecosystems. So in 2010, uh, we decided, some of us, to set up the Coral Triangle Center, as all the uh, countries recognized that building local capacity for long-term marine conservation was the one of the priorities to achieve those goals. And we looked also at uh, key specific sites. At the moment, we support 400,000 uh, hectares of marine protected areas, and we focus on Indonesia and Timor-Leste. And some of those sites is in our Bali, the Moluccas in eastern Indonesia, with some of those uh, charismatic species like the sunfish. And I just want to show you a uh, very short video of the manta rays offshore Bali. And these are really majestic creatures. It's just thrilling to actually swim among them. And I can really... Uh, advise you to all uh, try to snorkel. You don't have to dive, but you can actually swim among the mantas and actually feel their closeness very uh, much in the sea. But what we also try to do is provide a code of conduct how to approach those animals because a lot of people try to uh, pull the animal, uh, try to sit on the animal, and that's really uh, very detrimental to this animal too. And they're plankton feeders, so they don't uh, eat fish or any other things, but a lot of uh, plankton, usually shallow area. And we show this video to the dive operators. But unfortunately, they also take in the plastics. So you get also that these uh, animals take in plastics and really get into uh, very detrimental for these animals as well for their health. So the next time you do happen to find yourself swimming with the manta, here are some tips. First, stay calm as you watch them gracefully gliding through the water. Keep at least three metres away. You can look, but don't touch them. Be mindful of ways you can damage marine ecosystems. Your plastic waste on land can end up in the ocean and potentially harm manta rays and other marine animals. Let's protect manta rays for the better future of our oceans. And I know I have a very little um, time left, but just to share you also that we help establish new marine protected areas and we often do underwater surveys. We do socioeconomic surveys as well with the local communities and develop management plan trying to reconcile all those interests in a certain area. We also use local wisdom, uh, very much the local fishermen and communities 
they know much better about spawning sites, upwelling areas. They're very important to include in design of a marine protected area. And also uh, building the local capacity. So to date, we've trained more than 6,000 people in the region, government officials, NGOs, community leaders. And it's all about a very practical interactive training on how you develop a marine protected area, how to engage local communities in the planning. And these trainings are uh, usually three to six days with a very practical element in it. We also uh, work closely with dive operators. Uh, we are the official green fins assessor for Indonesia and Timor-Leste that uh, provides guidance to dive operators to become a very sustainable uh, dive operator. And we do also uh, adopt restoration of coral reefs and we set up an adopt a coral program so uh, people can adopt a coral and follow their baby coral online and how well it's doing. And it's a very popular uh, program among uh, volunteers and interns to actually help with this coral restoration uh, project. We do public outreach and we use, for example, the ocean puppets, the Wayan Samudra, which is very much a um, tradition in the communities in Indonesia to engage local communities and communicate um, key conservation messages to the community and engage them in a dialogue. And we also recently set up the Ocean Keeper Club for kids between um, 9 to 12 years old to really uh, give them more information about uh, marine biodiversity and the species living in those ecosystems. And uh, the center, uh, we have a public outreach center in Bali. You're very welcome to visit us. It's an art center, but also activity center where you can do things. And um, we have about 70,000 people since its inception in 2017. So a lot of classes come through, tourists, visitors, uh, corporate retreats are there, all with the theme on marine. And we also just opened up a uh, public exhibition with those key themes around uh, marine conservation. And uh, we have a crochet artist, for example, who knit a coral reef. It's a beautiful installation, but also an artist who used plastic ropes to actually um, make beautiful art uh, with that uh, technique. It's called weaving the oceans. And then all kinds of interactive fun learning activities. We have an ocean amazing ways. Uh, you can do a, a dive course with us, but also all kinds of other fun things. We also have two escape rooms. I hope you all like the escape room. <laughs> so you have to save the coral reefs in one hour or save the turtles from the passive soup. And I'm very happy that we have two CTC champions here, Chico and Adam, who are also game masters at our center. But I must say the millennials are the best families. Scientists, not so, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> They overthink it too much, less collaboration, no sense of urgency, but it, it's really a game, so you have to really get into it. But it's really a fun way to learn about diversity, the threats, and the solutions. And then we have internship programs, so like my colleague from Thailand, you're very welcome <laughs> to join us. Uh, we usually engage uh, interns, young people, students in coral restoration activities, also recently beach cleanups. Uh, we also offer training courses that you can attend at our center. So just as a concluding slide, now that I've also been working in this field for more than uh, 25 years, it's also important to keep very close to nature. And um, we, during the pandemic, we did various expeditions. We call it the Forgotten Islands. And then it's really beautiful to actually explore and actually still understand why we're all doing this. And I think that's very important. And the message I'd like to give to you all, do explore the sea, uh, try to snorkel, try to dive. And um, I think the um, two quotes I'd like to give here, and one is from Robert Swan. He says, you know, the biggest threat uh, to, is the belief that you think someone else will save the planet. And uh, Sylvia Earl says, uh, we can't do this alone but everyone can do something. And I think with this forum, I hope you will all engage also in marine conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shreeli. Now we have come to the, to the last of our speakers. 
uh, the one and only Professor Ruben Clements. Uh, he, he is the former Associate Dean of Research and Postgraduate Studies in the, in the School of Medicine and Life Sciences in Sunway University. He, he is also a Senior Fellow uh, with the Jeffrey Sachs uh, Center on, on Sustainable Development. He also co-founded a local non-profit uh, research organization known as RIMBA, which uh, conducts applied research on the conservation of threatened species and ecosystem in Peninsula Malaysia. Today, he'll be sharing more uh, about, about his journey through conservation and how he engaged with a variety of stakeholders to enact effective change uh, uh, and successful conservation practice. Professor Clements, please. everyone, good to be back in Singapore. I'm from Singapore originally and it's good to be back trying the best chicken rice in the world. <laughs> I brought with me two Malaysians. Um, thanks again for National Parks for bringing me back and supporting our transport here, but they now agree that it's the best chicken rice they had, right? Yeah. <laughs> and this picture also shows a bunch of Singaporeans going out there to Malaysia. So just now Dr. Anthony mentioned his advice get all of you to get out there and explore. This is what Singaporeans are doing in Malaysia. And this is my friend uh, Joel from uh, NUS, together with some undergrads. The nearest, this is the nearest country to you, so go out and explore it. That's, that's how Malaysia changed my life. I was gonna be an engineer, and I went to Malaysia when I was young. When I was 20, I took a road trip, and I saw the rainforest, and I fell in love with it, and I came back and changed my degree from engineering NTU to biology and US. So, Malaysia made me a biologist and today I'm just going to share with you how you can become a conservation scientist. So, three things here and how my scientific research has contributed to biodiversity conservation in Malaysia and finally, is it enough? Is it enough to do science? The answer is no. I'll tell you a bit about why you can, why there are other aspects in play. So, how did I become one? It all started with a hobby. Yesterday I met a young chap. He was into collecting photos of plants, right? But unlike him, I was really bad. I think really, please don't be angry. I was a poacher. I was poaching marine snails, mollusks in Singapore. That's what got me interested. I started collecting seashells by the seashore. There was not, there were no many, no many places in Singapore to get connected to nature, but this place I was really happy. Can anybody recognize this place? Any Singaporeans? This used to be the Tanah Merah Intertidal Flats. So I was really happy when I was young in the 90s, uh, going around collecting seashells and really started as a hobbyist. So I had to now pay for my sins. You know, I, I, I killed many marine mollusks and I'll tell you how I repaid a uh, tone for my sins in a bit. But this hobby, um, led me to have a passion, a passion into studying mollusks. And I, I took a road trip to Malaysia and I rented a proton, went across, and I saw these beautiful limestone casts where I was also poaching, you know, I, was, I had no permit. <laughs> I started collecting land snails, land shells of land snails. <laughs> so really bad, you know. <laughs> Don't follow my example, all right? Be like the guy um, I met yesterday. Ethan, Ethan, are you here, Ethan? No, sorry. Oh yeah, so you like him, okay? He collects plants, photos, right? Not photos are not plants, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I was collecting shells like this, but it got me really curious about malacology. Malacology is the science of mollusks, studying mollusks, all right? And land snails were really intricate. They got me interested in the evolution of land snails, and then became my obsession. I wanted to study snails for a living, right? I was hoping to get a job as a malacologist, but MPAPS didn't hire me. Uh, there was no position available. Is there a position for a malacologist now in MPAPS? But it's very low tech, okay? Just go out. Hopefully you'll de de develop some tech for land snail detection, right? But this is very low tech, they're so slow, they travel so slowly. You don't need technology for this. But this is the Nisun Song Forest again, poaching. Oh my God. <laughs> Terrible. But again, it made me who I am because I fell in love with the rainforest. And after I 
graduate in 2004 in, in, with a BSc in biology. I then met a tremendous man, as you know, as David Attenborough came to shoot one of his documentaries, Life in Cold Blood in Sungai Bulo, and then he told me, hey, everyone, you should go venture out there and help save the planet. Don't just study snails. So that's what I did. <laughs> I got a job. I got a job in uh, Petaling Jaya in KL. I joined WWF Malaysia, my first working experience managing 20 people. And that was how my journey into conservation began. I was not trained as a manager, but again, on the job training, uh, we have to do a lot of this. I was managing teams to go into the forest in Northern Malaysia, where I was managing the tiger and the rhino programs in places like Belum, Temango, and this is a uh, very, very beautiful rainforest. My first love is in the Belum rainforests. Beautiful. I got to live as a Singaporean in a kampong, learn how to sleep in a mosquito, uh, in, a, in a mosquito netting, a lot of blackouts in my village where I was living. Got to drive uh, four-wheel drive without, without uh, COEs. <laughs> Too expensive to own one, but I, I used all this training in the forest and navigated the harsh terrain, all in all in search of tigers and rhinos. And this is my first tiger punk mark that I saw way back then in 2008. And I was lucky to learn from Orang Asli, the indigenous people. They were teaching me how to cross rivers like this. And I was, this, was, this was my real national service. Okay? <laughs> this was where I really uh, got trained. And yeah, along the way, you meet many friends. Um, my record was 150 leeches in one day. But you gotta pay back, right? I gotta pay for my sins, right? I collected so many snails. <laughs> Learn how to sleep in hammocks. You don't, you don't sleep in tents in Malaysia. We sleep in hammocks, it's cooler. Learn how to catch fish, how to process the fish, how to fry it. So all these skills I did not learn in national service. I learned it in the Malaysian rainforest. <laughs> And all these were camera traps that we used to detect animals like this. So this is the saladang, a very beautiful, majestic animal in the rainforest. The forest cow is a very dangerous animal, but also very rare. The elephants, of course, and tigers. But then suddenly, <laughs> we also detected other things. Humans, so there were poachers in the forest. Um, so they came, they've come from Indochina. And you see things like this in the forest. So that got me really sad, right? Why are these poachers in the forest? Why is this is the skeleton of the gao? Saladang you saw just now. And you saw all these weird looking signs in the rainforest and then also deforestation within parks. And but at the same time you meet the Orang Asli and they tell you there's a lot of uh, bad stuff happening and then you wanna help, right? You wanna help and I decided to sort set up an anti poaching team. It was the first ever anti poaching team in Malaysia, a civilian one. We got 10 guys going out there to help stop poaching and these guys were just by the road. You can see the guy with the gun here. Yeah, we caught a few. We got people setting snares in the forest. This is my first anti-poaching unit. It's called a water protection unit. And we got 10 poachers arrested in that, in that year. 131 snares destroyed. So that short experience for me really made me want to go into conservation science. And how has it helped save biodiversity? Well, I went on to do my PhD and found out what were the impacts of roads on large mammals. This is my first field team during my PhD. I went to this state called Tringano, where there was nobody working. I met my wife, not in the jungle, but in WF. <laughs> we formed an NGO called Rimba. And then this is what Rimba is to this logo. But fortunately, we have closed Rimba now, 10 years of service, but we have incubated four new NGOs. And I'll tell you a bit about when we meet later. But the science was to find out whether these highway viaducts were useful crossing structures. So in, in Singapore, you have the eco-viaduct. Are they useful? Well, in Malaysia, what my research found that, well, not so useful. You get dead leopards on the highway. You get people with guns under the, hi under the viaduct. You get people roasting uh, non-human primates there. So again, there's lack of enforcement in these areas. If you don't enforce your wildlife viaducts, they're not going to be useful crossing structures. And also, the sign, my sign showed that the people were setting a lot of snares you know, closer to the road. This is a density plot showing that a lot of snares were set about within two kilometers from the road. And we also use uh, max end modeling to predict po poaching hotspots in the area. So we use science to really get better at catching poachers and some of the research is published in papers like this. 
And but again, for most importantly, you need to communicate the research to the government. And my thesis, thankfully, I used my thesis results to halt development in the wildlife corridor in Trangano. We spoke to the government and said, yeah, we'll stop the development for a while. But right now, my thesis is just a book stand for my, my laptop. It's not really useful at the moment. So as much as possible, you know, conduct problem-oriented research, find a problem, try to solve it. And in this case, poaching was a problem in, my, in the site where I work. So there are a lot of poachers from Indochina, indigenous people, and we found they were snaring a lot. And what did they poach? Poor tigers, pangolin, sun bears. And we found out that a lot of the animals were actually going back to countries like Vietnam and China. So there's an implication for zoonotic spillovers, like Dr. Na Anuwat, you were studying how you know, spillovers are happening. We need to protect the source here and prevent further wildlife from being transported back to the new Chinese countries. So we have a team of 16 heroes that we have right now in Kenya and they're actually going deep in the forest. When they see a poacher, they will contact our HQ and we call the wildlife department to come in. So this partnership with the wildlife department, that's how we get people arrested. We have managed to arrest 36 poachers so far and also more than 300 snares removed. So again, giving back to uh, nature, I can't, I can't say I was also a, a successful tiger biologist because we learned from so many of scientists and we found that tigers were increasing but unfortunately, very high turnover, and to be honest, our efforts were kind of not effective because tigers were still seeing not many yellow tigers left detected in 2014, very few resident tigers left, and a lot of incoming new tigers. That shows there's really high turnover. So we also use, work with game theory, work with uh, people use AI to get better at combating poaching. So this, you, can, you can use science, you know, but again, I feel science isn't enough. Right? You need to. Anybody doing psychology here, you are important, all right? Because we need to try to persuade people. And tomorrow I'm giving a workshop in Bukit Tima on how we can use persuasion science. There's six principles of persuasion to influence people for conservation. For example, the principle of scarcity. Always try to highlight how, highlight the losses rather than gains. Tell people how uh, your project will, if you don't do my project, you will result in a lot of bad stuff happening. So we, we tell, the Chief Minister of Tringanu, I told him, um, sir, please protect the forest for animals. But you know, that was I was really naive. Okay? I was say, what I should have done is done this so how much forest we left in a few years' time. It's the principle of scarcity, and then we use this to highlight if the forest were to be deforested, this is what's gonna happen. And we actually use this information, we lobbied with the state government and we got 30,000 hectares of forest protected in the state park. This is about half the size of Singapore. Imagine this kind of forest. No more logging. It's protected. Please come and visit it in Kenya. Also, do an internship with us if you want to. <laughs> and this yellow, this pink area here in Tringano is only one hour flight from KL, 45 minutes from the airport to the site. And right now, we are also trying to use religion. We work with religious people to spread awareness. Uh, we got the first fatwa issued against poaching in Tringano. We also had sermons read out on the mosque on Friday. We do before and after service with many mosques to find out the effectiveness of our sermons. And yeah, it's been quite useful. This has been published also on, on Frontiers and Environmental Science. We also right now, I believe, really need to work with economists and bankers. I'm moving more into sustainable finance to finance forest protection. That's what we're doing. There's so many other, so many instruments out there. You want to talk to me about them? We can have a chat after this. But we need long-term protection of forests, and this is the project I'm on now, Kenya for Life. We're trying to secure 200,000 hectares of forests through all these uh, with very various cool benefits for people and biodiversity. So it's called Kenya for Life. Uh, come and check out our project. If you want to intern here, let me know. <laughs> but in life, it's always like the right place, right time. I believe there's a lot of luck in conservation as well. Like today, if you met the Crown Prince, and if you were to be giving a talk right now one day, perhaps he'll see you giving a talk ask you to say, hey, help me out in Pahang, right? Help me out in my project. That's how I got access to the Trangunus Trangano Sultan because I gave a talk one day like this. He said, hey, come and give me a talk. And then we worked with him to protect 30,000 hectares of forest. So there's a lot of luck, right place, right time. I always try to keep giving talks. And this is the forest. This is what it looks like now. 30,000 hectares protected. This is the size of Penang Island. This is the size of that. If you've been to Penang, this is how big it is. So come and play in our park. Um, we need more. Uh, young people like you to help us, and this is what I've covered today. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Prof. Clemens. Please take a seat. Uh, uh, we will now be moving into the panel discussion. Right, uh, segment of the Shrek. Uh, we had the opportunity to hear about Professor Clemens' multi pronged approach to uh, protecting the Kenyan forest in Malaysia. Uh, we have listened to uh, Ms. Johani's efforts to work with the local community to uh, local community to protect uh, the marine species. Uh, uh, Mr. Ryan's technological approaches uh, to conservation. Ms. Nga's research into high-risk transmission areas in Vietnam, and Dr. Anwar's work into creating sustainable futures for both wildlife and humans to interact with on a daily basis. Uh, hmm. uh, like what we did in uh, track one, uh, please scan the QR code uh, on the stream to submit your queries. For those who may have trouble accessing uh, the link on stream, please raise your hand and a facilitator will come and get your questions. Uh, so, to get us started, uh, to get us started, uh, all of you here have years of uh, conservation work, right? Uh, you guys work with different communities, different stakeholders, uh, different companies. Uh, but in all your years, what do you believe is the biggest obstacle in the work of, uh, in conservation work? Me first. Oh, okay. The biggest obstacle is us. It's be it's human being. Yes, of us. Yes, we are all obstacle. But 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 we are we are or optimistically we are also the one who help to make it better. We can pay for our sin, like <laughs> Professor said earlier, right? So we, uh, yeah. In terms of conservation, if we think back, who make the you know, the nature be like this today is us, human beings, right? So we, it's time for us to make it right again. Yeah, that's my point of view. And other obstacle is that uh, the, the connection between institutes and inter, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, those things must be happening. Otherwise, if you keep in your silo, you just like, if you study about uh, psychology, you just think about people, don't think about ecology. And if you are the conservationist, you don't think about how to conserve it in your own way. You don't think, you don't talk with each other. So it will never happen in the right way. Uh, thank you, Professor Clemens. Uh, so with me, I, I, I think the obstacle will be uh, changed by my time. Like 10 or 15 years ago, when I, I first uh, start work with the wildlife health surveillance, um, at that time, I think the, more, the most difficult for us is the we don't know what we should be focused on. And uh, if we do surveillance, can we find some, something interesting to, to take action uh, and can be put? That can be the, uh, the good evidence to work with the government stakeholder. But now, after a lot of uh, effort, a lot of resource uh, to put in doing wildlife surveillance, we have more evidence al already. But uh, based on, on that, the knowledge of the community and also the government stakeholder, they already uh, be increased. But how to make it change uh, how to make their change on their behavior and from that to take action that I think that's the uh, also uh, I we think that as an uh, obstacle for our activity for now to take action to mitigate the risk and also to com combat the wildlife trafficking yeah okay um, I'll share a bit from the Singapore perspective so in, in Singapore it's all about balancing conservation and development because our land resource is just so limited. And when you have a situation like that, it becomes very important to be able to communicate um, conservation principles to the general public. Today we are here amongst people who are like-minded, but we shouldn't because of that thing that there is generally strong support for the things that we believe in. It may not be true, we cannot assume that it's true. What you read on social media again are from the 
vocal minority. So I, I think the, it's not an obstacle, which is a challenge that when we do conservation, we cannot assume that it is second nature because I think most people here, we are biophilic, we feel a connection to nature. Not necessarily the case. And uh, I mean, I've come from the public school system. I can tell you when I share things with my friends, they think that it's a joke. So um, we must continue this mission of breaking it down, dissecting it to something that can be relevant to the man in the street. Um, I think for marine, when I started in the late 80s, early 90s, there was very little attention to oceans. So what we did at the time was very much trying to document things, taking photos, video documentaries, but also we did a lot of fundraising, proposal writing, uh, I don't know how many proposals we wrote in those years, but it was really about trying to mobilize resources for oceans because all the attention at the time was um, to forests and to wildlife. And I'm so happy to see that the last 15 years or so, there's so much more attention to oceans, but... Sorry, Mr. Um, do you mind moving the microphone closer? Oh, sorry, yeah. yeah. So the, the biggest obstacle for us was to actually raise attention to oceans um, in the early 90s as one of the key obstacles. I think three, three big obstacles, they're quite equal. Number one, it's always funding. Right? But let's not talk about funding today. Number two, for me also, around with Orion, you know, inability to kind of persuade our stakeholders because a lot of us don't work with behavioral scientists or psychologists. Scientists are one of the poorest communicators. As an academic as well, I, I'm sad to say, we're very bad at talking to stakeholders, but we need to learn more from the behavioral scientists. And any of you out there interested in behavioral science, please go into that field. We need more of that badly to help us communicate the science. And thirdly, um, I think it's the lack of enough people taking a bigger picture approach. A lot of us tend to be so obsessed with saving our species. We want to save our, our species of choice, right? But at the same time, you don't take a step back to see the landscape really needs saving. And if you put all your energy to save, the landscape with the people in there, then you have a better chance of saving your species that you want. So try to take some time to step back and look at the bigger picture. All right, so those who are interested in behavioral science, I uh, hope to see you tomorrow at Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. All right, uh, so yeah, uh, there are questions from the audience. So uh, the first question, several types of animals, birds, mammals, and other mi uh, others migrate every year, and we cannot prevent this migratory behavior. What can we do if there are migratory birds, animals infected with the virus? Is there a way to prevent uh, prevent its uh, transmission? And how to solve this problem if the animals is infected? I think this question is more directed to Anwar and Dr. Anwar. Okay, yes, of course we cannot stop them from migrating. They, ha they have been doing like this for a thousand years and you cannot really stop them. Yes, of course. But what we can do is that we, because we need to live with it, that how the world, how the world works, right? Then we need to to to, to deal with uh, our own risk, thing in terms of us. Um, for example, if you if if you don't want to get virus viruses, not just only even flu from the birds. First thing, you may need to communicate with the tourists. Tourists love to to touch birds, right? In in Thailand, we have uh, the 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 seagull that I just talked about. Uh, people, sometimes they, they just hand, hand the crispy, crispy pork like this, and then the bird just get the pork right from the hands of the tourist. This is very risky behavior. So we need to inform them that it's risky. So one thing is the communication. Other thing is the early detection. Wildlife is out there. Wildlife is with them. They carry the wireless. It's like the, the plane carrying us across the continent. That happens all the time. So for us, we need to go, go there and then we capture some of them, of course. Then we take sample from them gently. <laughs> then we test it from the lab and then we see the likelihood that the world is, is there and how much chance that we can prevent it. And we may use the um, science like mathematical modeling to predict the likelihood that we get infected from those types of birds. 
uh, long story short, we cannot prevent them for such behavior, but we can protect ourselves by using science and technology. Uh, I think. This. I think we also need to keep animals happy in their habitat. So, if you want to prevent the next pandemic, you might want to keep bats happy, rodents happy, and how do we do that? In the protect the rainforests and where they are feeding and foraging need to be protected. There was a recent study in Nature a couple of months ago by Rena Plowright and her team in Australia. They were trying to find out why the Hendra virus outbreaks were happening uh, in uh, Brisbane. So they went to a horse farm, they interviewed the, the farmer and they said the bats were always eating the lemons next to the horses and then the virus outbreaks came. So she dug up the climate data and she found that the pets were only there because there was no fruiting and flowering in the forest. So we don't have forests with fruiting and flowering. The bats are going to come over. Animals are stressed, not just bats, right? A lot of animals all have viruses. When they shed viruses, and that's when you get the next spillover. And that's, I think, a lesson that we need to also keep protecting in their forests as much as possible. Oh, that's good. Thank you, guys. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next question, or is there anyone who wants to add on? I uh, just want to add that a, we certainly cannot stop migratory shorelets from flying in and out. Uh, but what we can do is to have a systematic sys regime uh, to take samples, to test them, to monitor biosurveillance. That's quite key and what the authorities should do. Maybe we have a big enough fence, right? So uh, I want to uh, move on to the next question. How can we encourage, support, or even change the mindsets, especially young naturalists, to focus on, to focus on or take in consideration of non-charismatic, ugly animals such as invertebrates, who are still part of nature. Did we repeat that? Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. How can we encourage, support, or even change the mindsets, especially young naturalists, environmentalists, to focus on or take in considerations? of non-charismatic, ugly animals such as invertebrates who are still part of nature? Yeah, maybe I can uh, answer. Uh, for us, it's also difficult to uh, hunt coral because you're not supposed to touch the corals. And they are uh, also very hard to sort of uh, personalize. So it's hard, like at the panda, as you said, for uh, WBF is so cute and so many cute animals, but how often so we uh, try to set up the adopt a coral program and then people still relate to that like they plant a baby coral and then they can make a name tag and they say okay good luck baby coral and they love to see how it's growing over the, the next few months or so and people love to engage so you have to hit emotional um, court with them even though they can't hug it or touch it I mean in principle any marine animal um, touch or hug. So for us, it's very important to bring people uh, to this and to really uh, get to know the animals and also have uh, them love the animals. And in a way, uh, we love to sort of revert, you know, the reference that people say, oh, it's just like in an aquarium. We love to switch back to, oh, it's just like the sea. So people have this experience, see how corals and fish are rather than from aquarium. Thank you. Anyone of the speakers wants to add on to that? I think maybe there's no need to change mindsets, I feel. I mean, if you like a certain animal, you like insects, you like invertebrates, that's okay. I mean, again, take a step back. The way are they living, right? Are they in the rainforest? Are they in quarries? Maybe your objective is to try to get them to save their habitats and they'll save your species of lesser interest, right? So maybe there's no need to kind of keep trying to change mindsets, but again, bringing people down to the habitats, like visiting reefs, like the royal family here in Bahang, they go to the forest, they get more engaged, and they learn about all this. I think having people go down to the ground, do field trips, get them connected to nature, I think then you get more people to appreciate the other uh, less charismatic species. Yeah. All right. Thank you. 
you guys. So, uh, hot question. Miss Really, do you analyze ecosystems and feeding patterns of marine life to study sustainability of seafood? Sorry, come again. Miss Really, do you <laughs> an, uh, analyze ecosystems and feeding patterns of marine life to study sustainability of seafood? Okay, great question. <laughs> um, yeah, we were sort of like uh, looking more at uh, diversity of uh, species and sort of analyze whether this area is important to protect, therefore um, set up a marine protect area. But uh, we also get a lot of questions about sustainable seafood. And so uh, we do support, uh, for example, you can actually trace how they catch the fish and how they catch the fish so the whole chain of custody can actually follow. Okay. And so uh, we do like to support those companies who actually have a, a certified a seafood uh, program set up. And so in that sense we support it, but our organization is not really studying the life cycle, for example, of uh, a certain fish that would be uh, great to farm in the future for seafood, for example. Uh, we know that uh, you know the Napoleon wrasse, which is a very popular uh, food fish for the markets in Hong Kong and mainland China, but no one knows exactly how this life cycle is actually in the sea. So there's still so much unknown about the life cycles of many seafood that we that we take. But uh, we focus more on identifying the div diversity of uh, species in an area. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rudy. So um, I think Mr. Ryan has talked about uh, technology, uh, technology in uh, conservation. So I would like to ask the, the rest and also to Mr. Ryan, what kind of technological advancements would you like to see in your field that could make conservation efforts easier for you? Uh, I know it's not. Okay, well, now we are able to use a combination of uh, different remote sensing me methods um, to survey trees in an urban setting. So if there are individual stands of trees, it's easy for me to do a LiDAR scan, do a street view camera, uh, and even train an AI to identify the species. But in the in, in context of the forest, when trees are growing in tiered canopies on top of each other, there's no way uh, a LiDAR scan, or it's difficult for, for LiDAR technologies to, to be able to delineate individual trees and then for you to process and, and do a remote survey. So I, I, I think the next leap is to crack that, that, that challenge, uh, to be able to leverage on LiDAR technology, which is what we have today as of now. Um, to be able to conduct a mass tree survey that will save the time of 20, uh, 20 man team that will take six months in the forest. And once you're able to do that, you're able to ascertain the value, the habitat value of a forest remnant, and you have a stronger case when you want to fight for conservation. Um. Yeah, we are using more and more technology, particularly in uh, monitoring the reefs. So for a long time, we just used the slate, and uh, our teams would just uh, write, uh, you know, a hundred meter transect, and they write what they see, what type of species, and so forth. Very time consuming, and you have to be really a specialist in taxonomy of corals. And uh, we are now moving into uh, reef imagery, using photos, videos, and getting into machine learning. So you get a better consistent data set uh, in this way, and also a data set that you can standardize across a country like Indonesia and link it to global data sets. And that gives us insight in um, which areas are um, diverse, damaged, are linked to each other genetically. So much more information we can get with uh, technology and machine learning, which becomes uh, quite an important uh, factor for us. And also the 3D part, so you can actually do 3D modeling of your reef and uh, look at more three-dimensional 
conservation activities, particularly looking at deeper habitats and the uh, interaction of shallow and deep water habitats and see what uh, we need to learn more about the deep waters and how they relate to nutrients, oxygen, uh, replenishment of larvae and so forth. So the technology uh, is very important for ocean conservation. Thank you. I think more for technology and satellite imagery has helped the work so much, remote sense, remote sense data. I think we also need to take a step back sometimes and see how we can go back to basics. We need to learn from indigenous people, IT or indigenous technology. <laughs> we need to talk to them more, learn from them because the Orang Asli in Malaysia, they are the best trackers for poachers in the forest. We try using so much fancy equipment, AI, machine learning, nothing beats indigenous knowledge. And I think we need to go back to basics and talk to these wonderful people in the forest to learn from them more. And that's how we get better at catching poachers. And also, even non-humans, dogs, like let's look to dogs to help us. So we have a conservation canine in Trengganu, the first ever Southeast Asian example of a dog that can track human scent for up to two days. Oh, uh, his name is uh, Piri from South Africa. We bought a 3,000 ringgit dog that allows us to track poachers. And they're also good at, of course, sniffing out uh, diseases, viruses, and also wildlife contraband at airports and seaports. We need to use, we need to invest more in our in, in life, right? Not just always look at technology. Okay, uh, actually I want to, I want to, uh, what Prof, uh, Prof uh, Clement said. Uh, this, this, uh, this audience member asked, you know, you have mentioned that you have engaged with Orang Asli in your work. Are they living inside the forest that you are protecting? If so, are they included in the management of the forest you and your team are protecting? What are the vital roles they play in conservation? Very good question. Yes, um, they actually living in the fringes, but they forage in the forest where we're protecting. So we always believe they will be the long-term guardians of the forest. We'll be just there for a while, but we need to build the capacity and involve them in co-management of the park. So recently, when we were creating the management plan for the park, we actually, for the first time, got Orang Asli to the state government office to like, plan the management together and really learn from them where are areas where we should do tourism, where we should uh, do the trails. So there's a lot of very progressive these days and protected area management really has to involve the Orang Asli or indigenous people from the onset and not have an afterthought. Yeah, so we're doing that but not many people uh, protected areas have done it in the past, but I, I see a lot of hope that uh, we are more progressive these days. All right, thank you, uh, uh, Clements. So, uh, uh, just uh, uh, just one question. So, uh, what what's a, what's a piece of advice that you can give to aspiring youth who wants to enter this field of conservational science? Science so statistics. Quote that people always refer to Mahatma Gandhi, but some say some saying that he, he never said that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the word is be the change, be be the change. Oh, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> be the change to. Oh yes, yes, that one. <laughs> Be the change you want to stay in this world. Yes, yes, and be the change with your uh, uh, interest to use power. That's for me. But I'm not sure whether Panama County is there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'm Gustavo. I'm going to say like, uh, we, we've done it, we still do it, and we believe that you, you guys can do more and better because you now have a lot of support a lot of opportunity to make it uh, better. So the question is our advice to expiring leaves. Oh, very simple. Volunteer for MPARCs or get an <laughs> And we'll turn your dream into reality. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. 
Um, no, I think we're all offering internships here. <laughs> so, so very welcome to come to Bali. I think no one uh, needs to Bali in that sense. But um, I think uh, uh, what I see is uh, a huge opportunity for the youth, and particularly because of the social media networks. And uh, if you look at the scale of our problems and also the urgency, uh, we really need uh, connectivity, not so much only in terms of the ecosystems, but also in terms of people. And I think it's very important that you all stay connected. Uh, we also facilitate, for example, learning networks among emerging leaders, women, um, and marine protected area practitioners. And those networks are very powerful. You can really change things by connecting, sharing your knowledge, your energy, and uh, try to uh, do something you believe in and that you can do with your group, uh, small, big, but you can connect. And I think uh, nowadays with the social network internet, this is the time to actually go to scale and really try to impact things um, at, a, at a global level. So I hope, our hope is with you, that you can actually make that global reach, that global impact, that you know, 30 years ago was not possible at all. Uh, maybe just, again, three things. Number one, volunteer, 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 right? <laughs> if you don't get a response from the email, try again. Email second time, third time, until a person sees the passion in you. And that's what they want to see. <laughs> the determination that you won't give up volunteering with an outfit, all right? So don't take the first lack of response as a rejection. And, and secondly, um, Find a mentor that can inspire you. I think a lot of us uh, are sometimes groping the dark. We don't, at this stage in life, uh, we may be too scared to approach someone to be a mentor, but I think a lot of the senior people here in the audience would gladly provide mentorship to kind of give you guidance. And yeah, just go up to the person and ask. You never know, right, what will happen. And I think in my, in my life, I've benefited from so many mentors that have helped me. Along the way, I stand on the shoulders of many, many giants, and I think um, you just need to, to find the right mentor to, to be a good fit for your passion. Again, number three, you don't have to be a biologist or do environmental science or geography to do conservation. What the world needs right now is really a lot more behavioral scientists, psychologists, economists, finance people to help the cause. And if you think, yeah, you, you might just want to be a biologist and study them, well that's fine, that's okay, right? But the skill sets that you will get from other disciplines will really help conservation go a long way and I think that's uh, hopefully see more people in other disciplines helping out in conservation. Because you don't want to be too poor, right? If you're a biologist, again, you might not be really rich, but uh, if you're a banker, you're an economist, you can also use your knowledge to help finance conservation, that's really important. Uh, yes, uh, I'll finish writing out, but so I'll ask a few more questions if you don't mind. Uh, what are the risks involved in your work and, and the research that, that each of you do? So uh, let me repeat again. What are the risks involved in your work and research that each of you do? It's, it's very straightforward for me. I'm working with diseases, right? So the risk is getting infected. <laughs> really straightforward. So if you want to work with diseases, if you want to work to capture animals in the field or work in the lab with the notorious viruses, so keep on yourself to yeah, to protect yourself, not to be infected. If you are infected you cannot work anymore, okay? <laughs> yeah, I agree with uh, the same with Doctor Arwat, but at this no thing like I just I mentioned before like uh, we do the research, but the risk is we could not find the, the thing we want to find. We want to identify, so that's the risk of the researchers when we do the uh, activity, especially with the wildlife, which is not many, many existing evidence uh, available. And Parks has very good health and safety protocols. <laughs> <laughs> probably wouldn't, wouldn't have that kind of risk. But another kind of risk that we do face is this sense that um, are we really, have we really surveyed the site properly? Did we really look at, turn every stone to check 
whether you know it's good enough to go. That's that's the reason that we we have to stick with it. We're not thinking, are we tolerant enough? Uh, so it's a different kind of risk. It's a mental hazard actually. <laughs> Thanks. I think uh, the risks uh, with MPAs, marine protected areas, are quite there. And just to give an example, um, we provided um, fish bombers in Komodo National Park with an alternative income. We tried to engage them in more sustainable fisheries. And before we knew, everyone was bombing because they thought they could get our support. And before and to get that support, they thought they had to bomb the reef. And so this was an unintended consequence of our our help and um, it, 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 so we realized that you have to do things um, you know in a pilot way so you can actually test whether what are the unintended consequences of our good intentions but it can go completely uh, wrong so I think uh, there are a lot of risks with um, protected areas and again you have to have a very strong communications team engaging indeed all the people living and depending on those areas from the onset with the planning and keep them all engaged while you're moving forward and so uh, if you don't have the capacity I would certainly you know recommend everyone in the MBAs to try to set up that capacity before you start even to think about setting up an unprotected area thank you The biggest risk, of course, in the rainforest is probably uh, maybe a snake bite <laughs> or getting attacked by a snake. But we have a good way of apprehending poachers, so it's actually low risk from catching poachers in our field site. We, we have a secret uh, operation, and we have a way in which we apprehend poachers safely. Don't tell, don't tell anybody, okay? At, at six o'clock, we blow the whistle, we raid the camp, we roll, it, roll them up in the hammocks and they're all in the hammocks and they get arrested. <laughs> so there's no risk of getting uh, hurt by guns or parangs. But <laughs> outside the rainforest, us, the, risk, the biggest risk to us is for me, just, I guess, burnout. Man. Burnout, mental health is such a huge uh, issue that's largely ignored by donors for projects. We wish that a lot more donors would pay attention to providing uh, therapy, counselling sessions for our staff because burnout is real, especially after COVID. And we want the young people not to burn out. A lot of them also uh, require access to mental health support. And I think that's something that will keep all of us going in conservation with this kind of added safeguards in place. I'd like to add a little bit. Um, opti optimistically, risk is something manageable, okay? So we can foresee the risk, the risk, what risk we, we're going to have in doing something. So we can foresee it and we can manage it. So risk is something manageable. And at most we, 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 do, we do that to keep everyone safe too. So it can, can be in turn with us. <laughs> <laughs> And, and just to add to Clement's point, I think um, what we see among young children is also this eco-anxiety. So the kids are so uh, subjected and exposed to the, the dooms and glooms about the planet. And I think what we experience with our children programs is you have to keep it playful and also give this message of hope because it's so easy to just focus on the negative part. And I think you have to keep it positive and hopeful, especially for young children who are now more and more also getting depressed about everything you can find on the news or on the internet. So this eco-anxiety was very much identified by teachers of elementary schools that we should try to address it as well moving forward. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining us in the panel session. Unfortunately, that will be the last question because we ran out of time. Uh, so uh, that brings us to the end of our panel discussion and as well as our second track of the day. Thank you all for joining us and uh, I'll pass my time now to Nashri. All right, thank you very much, that's really uh, So let's do a quick uh, sharing for a token of appreciation for our speakers. Right, so first, let's present one to Prof Ruben.
Next for Miss Really. And next for Miss Gun. And last but not least for Mr. Anua. So thank you very much to our track two speakers. Could I get you all together in the middle for a photo? All right, thank you very much to our second track speakers. Okay, so uh, for all of our participants today, uh, you guys got a name tag, right? Anyone does not have a name tag? Okay, a couple of, okay, quite a few of you. All right, so uh, for those of you with a name tag, there is a number uh, on your tag. For those of you without a name tag, uh, you can proceed to where the registration counter was. You guys know where that is? Right. Just right outside along this stretch of the, the hall. Uh, you can go over there and get your name tag and that number will be the table that you are assigned to for the focus group discussion, which will be happening next. So, uh, those of you who don't have the number, like the name tags, do you have your bag? Anyone does not have the bag? The, the goodie bag? Alright, everyone has it? Okay, fantastic! Inside! Okay, if you don't have it, also go to the registration counter. All good? Alright, so inside your bag, you have a stack of postcards designed by our dear photographer, Faith. Where is she? She's somewhere around. But, bring these postcards to your table because uh, we'll be using them for the focus group discussions. So uh, for those joining us online, thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of the live stream. So uh, thank you. Goodbye.